start in a minute or so or less. Okay, you're live. And I will go to gallery view. Oh, sorry, speak of you. Yes. Okay. Um, so I think it's, um, I think we can start. So let's get started. Uh, welcome, everyone. Hello. Uh, welcome to another International Manifesto Group webinar. As many of you will know, the International Manifesto Group was created in 2020 to discuss world events from a left and anti-imperialist perspective. And since then, we've also issued a manifesto, which you can check out at www.internationalmanifesto.org. I'm Radhika Desai, and I'm the convener of the International Manifesto Group and the moderator of today's event, at which we'll be launching Carlos Martinez's critically important and brilliantly titled book, The East is Still Red. While thinking about how to introduce Carlos's book, I thought, what are the most important reasons why people should read it? So, well, I came up with two. The first is, of course, the ever-mounting disinformation, propaganda, and just plain lies that pervade the Western media when it comes to China. Anyone who wants to really understand what the People's Republic of China is all about could benefit a great deal from this little book. It provides exactly the sort of big picture orientation that one needs uh, uh, and that one should have before going more deeply into any aspect uh, that one is uh, interested in. The second reason has to do, of course, with the appalling state of the left in which all sorts of really scurrilous um, accusations are thrown around, accusations about China's imperialism and China's capitalism and whatnot. And I know Carlos is going to talk about this in greater detail, so I'll simply say that this explosion of accusations is arguably one of the biggest obstacles to creating a coherent left today. But I think most of what I want to say is actually why you should read books by Carlos in particular. That is to say, you may find other books on China, but why read Carlos? Well, going back to his previous brilliantly, equally brilliantly titled book, The End of the Beginning, which was about the Soviet Union. And of course, the title by, by giving it that title, Carlos meant that really the end of the Soviet Union was not as was celebrated in the capitalist media and commenta commentariat, et cetera, the end of socialism, but just the end of the beginning of socialism. So it's about the first major socialist experiment in the world, the Soviet Union, its rise and demise. And in that book, Carlos provides an excellent overview of the main questions that anybody would in interested in the emancipation of humanity would have about the Soviet Union, the nature of its socialism, the scale of its achievements, and much else besides. So basically, the way I see it, Carlos has taken it upon himself, and I think done so with great aplomb, the task of understanding what socialism really looks like when it's at home, when it must arise in our world, not some otherworldly type of socialism. In a certain sense, in fact, to borrow an expression uh, sorry, rather the, borrow the title of another brilliant book that emerges from the same neck of the political woods, Carlos Garrido's The Purity Fetish. Carlos Martinez's book provide us with a way of ridding oneself of this purity fetish, the inclination to think that no socialism is worth it unless it's some kind of shining fairy tale like paradise. Carlos's books show us that since socialism must arise in this world, since it must uh, arise in a world devastated already by capitalism and imperialism, it is bound to have to make some compromises. It is inevitable that some mistakes will be made in building it and that it will continue to suffer from all sorts of class contradictions and struggles for quite a long time before something that we would all say is some kind of socialism is actually established. The origins of capitalism, by contrast, which lie in, the, in what Marx, to use Marx's words, in conquest, enslavement, robbery, murder, in short force, 
and whose early histories was written again in Marx's words in Letters of Blood and Fire, this, these origins are frequently celebrated as some kind of a juvenile hijinks on the part of an otherwise you know, wonderful system in tales of robber baron capitalism. If this venal system is understood in these ways, then surely the origins of an attempt to build a just society um, to rescue people and peoples from this venal system and its imperialism, uh, attempts to, to build such a, such a society that are almost always up against a great deal, the devastation of imperialism at home, the opposition of imperialism abroad, should get some, should get cut some political and moral slack. And Carlos's books help us to understand the, the understand this and the emergence of really existing socialism in these ways first in the end of the beginning and now in the East is still read. So let's hear more about this wonderful book. First, I want to invite Carlos to say a few words and then we have uh, uh, about five or six rapporteurs, each of whom will speak for about eight to 10 minutes addressing the themes that they feel are the most important in Carlos's book. Then I will give Carlos a brief uh, an opportunity to respond and then we will open up for a broader question and answer. Overall, we'll try to keep the event to about two hours. So let me start by uh, introducing Carlos. Me me of course, many of you are here because you know, already know who he is and want to hear more about his latest work, but let me just say that Carlos is an independent researcher and political activist in, in, in London, in the UK. He's the author of this book we are discussing today, The East is Still Red, but also of No Great Wall on the Continuities of the Chinese Revolution, which of course addresses the critical question uh, 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 or the issue of whether China underwent some kind of a radical break in its revolutionary history with reform and opening up. And of course, as I mentioned, the end of the beginning lessons of the Soviet collapse. His main area of research is the construction of socialist societies, past and present. He's co-editor of Friends of Socialist China and co-founder of the campaign No Cold War. So Carlos, please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks to everyone for attending today's launch and particularly, of course, to the speakers and to the organizers and to Radhika for hosting and chairing, and it has to be said, for giving an excessively generous introduction. Um, and one request, Radhika, while, I'm in, while I think of it, would you switch your view to speaker view for the sake of the live stream? I think I'm in speaker view. Oh, okay, great. Yeah. Um, and also I need to thank Praxis Press for doing a really great job of editing and, and publishing the book. So there are tons of themes in the book that I consider to be quite important. Um, there were lots of reasons for writing it, but today I wanna to touch on one in particular as it's in my view, very relevant to informing a socialist and anti-imperialist strategy in the West today. And that theme is the idea that China is an imperialist country and that the new cold war is an example of inter-imperialist conflict. You know, you can read it in Jacobin. In Jacobin, you can read, the, the US-China rivalry is an inter-imperial rivalry driven by inter-capitalist competition. You can read it in Counterfire here in Britain. China is an emerging imperialist power that is seeking to assert itself in a world dominated by the established imperialist power of the US. I think it's really crucially important to debunk these claims, you know, not out of some kind of ideological purism, but because the idea of China as imperialist, the idea of the new Cold War as an inter-imperialist conflict is just profoundly demobilizing at a time when we need people to be mobilized. You know, after all, if China is an imperialist country, then we as socialists, as communists, as progressive, as, as anti-war campaigners shouldn't be siding with it against the US, against the West. We should adopt a position of neither Washington nor Beijing. And if the new Cold War is an inter-imperialist conflict, and if the US wins, if China is successfully encircled and contained, if its rise is prevented, if its government is overthrown, you know, if China's dismembered, well, you know, if China's an imperialist country, then that set of outcomes would be like neither here nor there to us. It would have no meaningful impact on the overall state of the global class struggle. Now, it seems to me perfectly obvious, at least, that such a position is totally and utterly incorrect, is dangerously wrong. 
it seems perfectly obvious to me that the survival of People's China and the success of its socialist project and its multipolar project is hugely important, uh, not only to uh, ordinary people in China, but to the global working class and oppressed peoples. So let's take a look at this idea that China is imperialist. Like, What's the basis for the claim? And, you know, I'm kind of I'm choosing to ignore the wild statements of people like Mike Pompeo and Hillary Clinton and Anthony Blinken here. Like my focus is on what do leftists mean when they accuse China of imperialism? And I think the idea rests on a pretty superficial and dogmatic understanding of what imperialism is. You know, the, the, the foundational theoretical text on imperialism was, of course, written by Lenin in 1916. And Lenin showed that once capitalism had developed to a certain stage, where free competition had given way to huge monopolies, it could only continue to expand, it could only continue to grow through the domination of the resources, the markets, the labor and the land of other countries. And, and by the time that Lenin was writing, the world was essentially divided into an imperialist core, including Britain, including the US, France, Holland, Germany, Russia, Belgium, Japan, and a couple of others, and a colonial periphery. And you know, the, the core of Lenin's analysis still holds, but there have been some very important changes in the world situation since that time. Firstly, and most obviously, as of 1917, there's been a socialist camp. There's been a group of countries outside the imperialist system, a group of countries that are neither oppressor countries nor oppressed countries that assert their sovereignty and that pursue development and pursue modernization but without relying on the exploitation of or domination over other countries. Second point is that we're in a long ongoing process of decolonization. The masses of Africa, of Asia, of the Middle East, of Latin America, of the Caribbean, of the Pacific have stood up against colonialism, have won their independence. You know, these countries, which you know, we, we often refer to as the countries of the global South, are certainly still subjected to imperialist pressure. They certainly remain vulnerable to hegemony, to bullying and coercion, but their situation is significantly different to a century ago. You know, if we let's take, for example, Algeria or Iran or Mozambique or Mexico or Cambodia, um, these countries have got far greater control of their destinies, are far better equipped to defend their interests than they were previously. So, you know, imperialism still exists, but its dimensions have changed along with changes in the global political situation. But we've got you know, some people on the left who want to absolve themselves of any responsibility to analyze these changes and to update their analysis. They look at China, they see that it's a relatively advanced country, it's a relatively powerful country, it's integrated to a significant degree into the global economy, it has some huge companies, some monopolies. Um, they see that it's involved in the export of capital. It's investing in projects overseas. It's loaning money to other countries and so on. And they conclude, well, you know, on the basis of this checklist, China must be imperialist. Um, but, you know, by definition, like if this is the definition of imperialism, you're know, meeting, you're know, ticking off those checklists, then probably the majority of the countries in the world today are imperialist. India's imperialist, Brazil's imperialist, South Africa is imperialist. But if all these countries are imperialist, frankly, the word has lost any useful meaning. The, world, the word imperialism is literally empireism. Clearly, imperialism has to include some notion of empire, of domination, of hegemony. So the questions that we have to ask about China are, does it seek to dominate foreign markets, foreign land, labor and resources? Does it use its economic strength to dictate policy or assert hegemony over poorer countries? Does it go to war in pursuit of its economic interests? Does it engage in regime change, in destabilization, in unilateral sanctions and economic coercion in pursuit of those economic interests? Because all of that is what actually existing imperialism looks like, right? Let's take the last 25 years. Um, the US and its allies have waged wars and proxy wars against Yugoslavia, Afghanistan, Iraq, Libya, Syria, and now Russia. They pursued destabilization and regime change against Venezuela, Nicaragua, Iran, Eritrea, Zimbabwe, and numerous other countries. They've engaged in economic coercion, against Cuba, 
the DPRK, Venezuela, Nicaragua, again, Iran, Belarus, and numerous other countries. The US maintains over 800 overseas military bases. It's got active duty military troops stationed in nearly 150 countries. That's you know, close to three quarters of the world's countries. The US's military expenditure is close to a trillion dollars a year. You know, this country with 4% of the global population accounts for almost 40% of military spending. Meanwhile, Western financial institutions are notorious for the use of predatory and conditional loans, which they use to extort the countries of the global south and force them into dependency, austerity, and privatization. So we really don't need to engage in conjecture. We know what imperialism looks like. The question is, is that what China's involved in? Uh, in my opinion, uh, the great Hugo Chavez put it extremely well, put it very succinctly. China is large, but it's not an empire. China doesn't trample on anyone and it hasn't invaded anyone. It doesn't go around dropping bombs on anyone. And you know, this is a very profound point and it's made by a lifelong, passionate, proven and extremely effective anti-imperialist. Yes, sure, China has become a major power. It's the world's second largest economy. Its people live an awful lot better than they used to. It's a science and technology powerhouse increasingly. It does invest in projects in other countries. But the whole nature of the Chinese economy and Chinese society is fundamentally different to that of the West. China's economic rise hasn't been based on domination. It hasn't been based on monopolizing other countries' resources. It's been based on the extremely hard work of the Chinese people, the strategic brilliance of the CPC leadership, and on the enduring gains of the Chinese revolution, which put the people in charge of their country's destiny. You know, the fact that China doesn't have a capitalist ruling class distorting economic strategy um, in the service of its own self-interest, its own kind of selfish and short-term gains, means that it's able to pursue a fundamentally different model of development, of modernization. China doesn't engage in wars of domination. You know, China hasn't been at war for over 40 years. It doesn't have a global infrastructure of hegemony. It doesn't have foreign bases and troops and weapons stationed in other countries. It doesn't impose unilateral sanctions. It doesn't engage in nuclear bullying. It doesn't interfere in other countries' internal affairs. It doesn't threaten other countries or engage in destabilization. Its loans, its investment throughout Africa, throughout Latin America, the Caribbean and elsewhere are welcome. You know, or pretty much universally welcomed because those loans come with a low rate of interest, no conditions of austerity, unlike IMF loans, and because they're used to fund crucial infrastructure projects that are actually allowing countries to break out of underdevelopment after centuries of colonial and neo-colonial exploitation. For example, with Chinese finance and support, Ethiopia opened the first metro system in sub-Saharan Africa a few years ago. With Chinese finance and support, Bolivia launched a telecom satellite that provides connectivity to the whole country. And you know we're talking about the poorest country in South America. China built the new African Union headquarters in Addis Ababa as a gift from the Chinese government. Uh, the same with Zimbabwe's new parliament building. What a contrast, what did Britain do to support governance in Zimbabwe? It imposed an apartheid dictatorship. What does the US do in Zimbabwe? It imposes suffocating sanctions. China, meanwhile, gives it a parliament building. Contrast China and the US when it comes to the Middle East. You know, the US and its allies have fought devastating, let, I mean, let's just call them what they are, genocidal wars in order to control the natural resources of the region. In Iraq now, there's a popular saying, the US bombs while China builds. And in no area of life is that more true than with schools. The US bombed literally hundreds of schools during the Iraq war. China is currently, like right now, building literally thousands of schools in Iraq. In Ukraine, the US did everything it could to bring about this conflict, and now it's doing everything it can to keep the conflict going, to fight Russia to the last Ukrainian. China, meanwhile, is coordinating with other countries and leading efforts to bring about a solution to the crisis based on dialogue and mutual respect. So the idea that China is an imperialist country it just doesn't stand up to any kind of scrutiny. Actually, there's a far stronger case to be made that China is a victim of imperialism. The US and its allies, for example, think nothing of fermenting separatism in Taiwan in order to destabilize China and to prevent its reunification. They station 
tens of thousands of troops in South Korea, in Japan, in Okinawa and Guam, with a view to encircling China. They go to all sorts of measures to foment unrest in Xinjiang, Hong Kong and Tibet. They're doing everything they possibly can to hold back China's emergence as a technology superpower. They send their warships to the Taiwan Strait and the South China Sea to intimidate China. They maintain a permanent nuclear threat in the region. You know, China's strong, China can stand up for itself, but the US-led imperialist system is undoubtedly trying to squeeze it. Um, you know, the reality is that China's development of friendly relations with the countries of the global South, its investment and loans, its promotion of multipolarity are contributing to undermining the entire imperialist system. You know, if a country needs investment and it's not forced to go to the IMF and it's not forced to go to the World Bank and it's not forced to accept onerous loan conditions and it's not forced to accept foreign troops on its soil and it's not forced to privatize and deregulate its economy, that means it's got the possibility of modernizing, of developing without compromising its sovereignty. It can choose a development model that's suited to its own interests. And you know that opens up very important possibilities. You've got countries such as Venezuela, Bolivia, Nicaragua, who over the last couple of decades have been exploring new paths to socialism and the support of China, its availability, its willingness to engage in mutually beneficial trade and investment has been hugely important to that process. So you know, China's pursuit of multipolarity and its whole economic and political and foreign policy model is breaking the stranglehold of imperialism. And in doing so, it creates new opportunities for socialism as well. So, um, sorry, I've gone on for too long, but to conclude, it's essential that we firmly reject and debunk this notion that China is an imperialist country, this notion that the that US-China tensions are a matter of inter-imperialist rivalry. We should be defending China and we should be mobilizing the masses in their millions to fight against what is a reckless and disastrous new Cold War. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, uh, Carlos, for that um, really eagle's eye view of imperialism's activities around the world. Uh, now we will start with all the, uh, I guess, rapporteurs or commentators on um, uh, on Carlos's book. And we will begin with Ben Charco. Uh, this audience should not, um, uh, should not uh, need too much of a introduction to him, but Ben Charco is the, is an English journalist and an editor of the, uh, and the editor rather, of the Morning Star newspaper. So Ben, please go ahead. Thanks very much, Radhika, and, and uh, thanks Carlos for asking me to speak at this launch. Um, Carlos is an old uh, friend of the Morning Star, regular contributor to the pages of the Morning Star, and I believe some of the chapters of this book, in fact, uh, had their kind of initial incarnation as articles in the Morning Star. So it was a real pleasure to see that brought together in the East is Still Red, which our newspaper has already recommended to its readers, and I'm very happy to recommend that to everybody watching today. I do think it's a really important book and a really good introduction to the topic as well. It's not a book you need to know much about Chinese history or Chinese politics to be able to follow and to, to grasp. So um, I think um, I agree absolutely with everything Carlos has, has just said. Um, but I think I'd like to to concentrate a little bit in my uh, my contribution on why it's significant for us to understand China in terms of the impact on political decisions in the West and particularly uh, speaking from London uh, in, in Britain. Uh, understanding China could hardly be more important. People have been saying that for a couple of decades now because China is very obviously important based on its size, based on the, the fact that its economy has been growing so fast for so long. Um, but it's got a lot more urgent just in the last few years uh, because um, the extent to which US hostility to China has become more marked in just the last very few years has ushered in a completely new era in international politics. Um, a new Cold War which decided to dominate US foreign policy globally and the foreign policy of US satellite states such as Britain, which has not shown any uh, independent mindedness over over this question. So attitudes to China are now of direct relevance to government policy in our own countries. Trade decoupling with China is already damaging the British economy. Decisions like picking out Huawei from development of 5G um, seriously retarded the rollout of that technology in Britain. 
uh, a tenfold increase in the number of foreign students who were denied the right to study or research in Britain on national security grounds just in the last two years. That indicates a collapse in international scientific cooperation driven by the new Cold War. That will hamper joint work on preventing or curing pandemic illnesses shortly after a global pandemic killed millions of people around the world, including almost 200,000 people in Britain. It will have a crippling effect, of course, on efforts to mitigate climate change or develop green technologies, a field in which China is the world leader, something which uh, Carlos looks at in uh, one chapter in particular, of the, book, uh, the, the one treating China as an ecological civilization. We've already seen accusations such as that um, there's use of forced labor in Xinjiang used to sanctions on Chinese exports, which have slowed down the rollout of solar power in Western countries uh, in the US and Europe. We've seen paranoia just last week over China's alleged ability to use any electronic device to spy on us, um, used by Tory MPs to say that we need not only to restrict the import of uh, electric vehicle technology from China, but in fact, we need to abandon all of Britain's targets for rolling out electric vehicles and for abandoning diesel and petrol cars because any such technology is just a Trojan horse for Chinese influence in, in the UK. And worst of all, current US policy can be described not just as a new Cold War, but as a drive to war. So the US is clearly not at all confident of its ability to win through peaceful competition with China. And again, I think um, this is a, an interesting aspect to Carlos's book is looking at the reasons why um, it's almost impossible, in fact, for China to lose this new Cold War. Um, that's behind uh, the attempts by the US to, to strangle China's technological development through bans on computer chip exports and so on. Um, um, but it's also uh, it's also got much more serious consequences down the line because if the US concludes that it cannot mm -hmm. defeat China through peaceful competition, and obviously uh, it has a, a motive to consider direct military conflict um, as the means to see off the Chinese threat. During the first Cold War, the United States killed millions of people in proxy conflicts um, with the Soviet Union countries, including Korea, Vietnam, the dirty wars in Latin America, and so on. Um, but I think it is clear that at most points in that Cold War, decision makers in Washington, as well as Moscow, were genuinely very wary of provoking an outright war between uh, the two superpowers. That's not nearly so clear today. The Biden administration sways both ways on it periodically seeming to want to rebuild links and so on and restore dialogue, but also pushing very recklessly at Chinese red lines over questions like Taiwan, um, you know, ripping up the rule because even Henry Kissinger admitted in Beijing, tearing up all the agreements that uh, were struck in the 1970s, but formed the basis of relations between the People's Republic of China and the United States. Um, the US whips up scares over nonsense like the alleged spy balloon, which it quietly admitted shortly afterwards was, was nothing of the kind. And we have the notorious comments from US Air Force General Mike Minahan that war between the United States and China will break out the year after next. So why this difference? I think Carlos treats some of it in the book. China is on course to overtake the US economy in overall size, something which the Soviet Union never came close to doing. China's population is almost five times larger than that of the United States. Um, so, um, you know, if, if China gets richer to the point where Chinese people per capita income is similar to the US's, then automatically China's overall economic weight would be much, much greater. And I think that aside from those kind of Chinese strengths, there are other reasons why today's politicians may be more reckless than those of the, the 1950s and 60s, including the fact that this is not a generation that has come through uh, a world war or two world wars as, as world leaders had then. I think there is a genuine... Um, a sort of an ability to compete among certainly British MPs, and you listen to the debates in, in Parliament, the fact that we are in a new period where the West cannot always get its way with impunity, and there are serious consequences to engaging in military conflict with um, rivals on the scale of, of China. But whatever those reasons are, the threat of a new Cold War is something we need to take very, very seriously. And if we're to build a peace movement capable of challenging our government's drive to war, we need to counter the propaganda that depicts China as a threat to the West and engage in myth-busting about the uh, nature of the country's economic and political system. And I think that's the real strength of Carlos's uh, book. 
Um, it's a real good myth-busting book, and its thematic format, which uh, maybe has some origins in its uh, beginning as a, a series of different articles, makes that it, it's very useful as a kind of reference book as well. You can think, am I, do I need to challenge uh, propaganda about um, China's, uh, China's role in climate change? You can turn to that chapter on ecological civilization. Do you want to look at the war on poverty? There's a chapter specifically uh, dealing with that. So there's just four points that I'll wrap up very quickly on um, um, that I think are really key to the key points where, where this book helps you to cut through the propaganda. And the most obvious of those is the kind of opening point that Carlos used. China is a socialist country. The standard narrative in, in Britain, um, certainly 20 years ago when I started studying Chinese at university, was that China was now a capitalist country, that the end of history had happened. Um, and the adoption of market mechanisms meant that it was it was capitalist. At that time, it wasn't really seen as a threat. Uh, it was more seen as an investment opportunity in uh, in Western circles. But whatever contradictions are at play, and there are contradictions in market socialism, there are capitalists in China, there are wealth inequalities and so on. The assessment of China as a capitalist economy falls far short um, of the reality when we look at the dominant role of publicly owned enterprises at all levels in China, the common ownership of land, and the abundant evidence that Chinese policy is directed at the welfare of the whole people and not a small elite. So when we talk about achievements in poverty reduction, there's often this impression given in papers like the Financial Times that China's achievement in poverty reduction is because it adopted capitalist economic relations. But actually, the long war on poverty, that chapter of Carlos's book really goes into the detail. There's nothing like this in other um, developing countries. There's no similar poverty reduction achievements in India or Brazil or countries that have maintained capitalist relations. And it's also interesting to look at how this anti-poverty campaign has delivered, particularly in the recent period, the kind of mass line mobilization elements that have come back to the fore under Xi Jinping. Um, so I think that's a useful primer on, on that point. Um, another one would be this issue of climate change. Um, the idea of China, obviously, it's the world's biggest manufacturer and emits a lot of greenhouse gases. And that's used to imply that China has an outsized responsibility for climate change, so that it's an unrepentant polluter and so on, even if much of its manufacturing is for Western markets and Western consumption in the end. And, um, so balancing that narrative with the evidence of China's dominant role in green tech and renewables and so on is really, really important. I think that's done very well. And that ties us back to another advantage of this idea of, of pressing the reality of China as a not a capitalist country which is that we need the left in countries like Britain to start looking to China for solutions for uh, particular policy problems. You know, the China's lead in, in renewables is down to strategic investment, public investment, a planned economy. And these are lessons which need to be taken up in the British labor movement in terms of the political demands that we make. We can make an analogous case in terms of high-speed rail. I know I'm running out of time, so I'll just... Um, I, I had two more points to run through, but I think that uh, Carlos has kind of covered uh, one of them, certainly in, in great detail, which is the, the issue of atrocity propaganda. There is a lot of unquestioned um, allegations thrown around in the Western media about uh, human rights abuses by the Chinese government, uh, particularly the, the kind of really ludicrous accusations of genocide in Xinjiang and so on. Now, while these are repeated from lots of different sources, it's very, very useful to start to do not, not a huge amount of digging, to be honest, to, to find out that they all come down to a very, very narrow um, uh, selection of origin uh, accounts by some very, very dubious characters such as Adrian Zenz. Um, so... Uh, I think it's really, really useful in terms of as a primer to hit back at that kind of propaganda, which often is just cited in Western media and in and meetings and in the trade union movement without being rebutted as you know, if you're going to level accusations like genocide, you really need to be backing that up with some evidence. And that evidence simply does not exist. And the last point just does draw it back to, I think, Carlos's introduction, which is whose fault is the new Cold War? If we have this idea that China is uh, becoming more aggressive, more aggressive and more isolated was the phrase used um, by the BBC quite recently. I think that um, it's, well, it's completely counter to the facts China's the world's, you know, 
the biggest trading partner of a majority of countries worldwide. The Belt and Road Initiative has overtaken the World Bank as the largest lender for development infrastructure. Uh, China has overtaken the United States recently as the country with the most diplomatic missions worldwide. There's no sense in which China is more isolated um, than it used to be. But also this idea that tensions over Taiwan and so on are driven by a more aggressive, more assertive Beijing. That is counter to the actual chronology of this new Cold War. The sanctions, the aggression are all coming from the West. They're all directed at China. And that's really important for opposing these policies by our own governments to point out, you know, we have started this fight. There's no reason for us to do so. And not only is there no reason for us to do so, but the vast majority of the world's countries welcome the rise of China because it is challenging this imperialist world order, this hegemony that we are now seeing beginning to unravel in various parts of the world. Niger would be maybe the most uh, recent uh, site of tension. We certainly don't have time to start talking about the the issues there, but in in, uh, region after region, we're seeing countries try and break free from economic domination by a handful of imperialist countries. And China really provides- Wrap up now. Uh, Yeah, uh, I'm, yeah, I'm sorry for, for going on too long, but essentially that is what I wanted to conclude on, which is that China's rise is not a threat to the West. It is actually connected to this decolonization movement internationally. It's a democratizing movement and it's one which socialists everywhere should welcome. So on all those grounds, do read Carlos's book. Thanks so much, uh, Ben, Um, and sorry to have to cut you off. It was a very interesting speech, but we should try to keep to time a little bit. Um, Okay, so our next speaker is uh, Chen Weihua, uh, who is the uh, EU Bureau Chief of the China Daily Newspaper, which is published in English, as most of you will know. Uh, And he has previously served as um, a Chief Washington Correspondent for the same newspaper, for the US edition, rather, of China Daily. So uh, Chen Chen Weihua, please, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Desai. Uh, thank you for inviting me and give me the honor to speak at today's events. I first want to congratulate Carlos for the accomplishment of publishing the book, The East is Still Red. Mm-hmm. And also I want to thank Carlos for the very strong support to China against the old, I would say China haters, the vicious Cold War and hot war, warmongers, you know, in their reckless attempt to smear China and contain China. And uh, whether, you know, I think uh, Carlos has been very active on Twitter, in articles and speeches. And I just want to make uh, uh, several quick points. I think the book is very timely because it provides a valuable food for thought. Uh, when people, some people are debating whether China is uh, still a socialist country or how much it still is. If you talk to different people, of course, you may get di- very different answers and analysis. I think uh, Carlos's book has provided a very strong argument that China is still a socialist country, you know, after the launch of reform and opening up uh, drive in 1978. And uh, some of the measures, of course, are regarded by some as a uh, and orthodox, you know, uh, by some socialist country. But I think uh, using the many analysis and uh, data from, uh, say, poverty elevation to ecological civilization, I think uh, Carlos' book has shown that, uh, you know, the Chinese government is a government that is people-centered and has delivered greatly to the 1.4 billion people. Actually, I, you know, I uh, you know, I stationed uh, many years in the U.S. too. I, I have uh, lots of contact with the China experts in the West, in the in U.S. or Europe. Actually, most of them admit that the Chinese government, uh, you know, despite things they did, uh, disagree. I mean, the Chinese government is known for under promise but over deliver. And the achievement in China is uh, phenomenal and uh, nothing short of a miracle as someone, you know, who uh, from China. Uh, China is the second largest economy in the world, the largest uh, 
actually, uh, several years ago already in terms of PPP, purchasing power parity, uh, the faster rising living standards. I mean, if you look at the Chinese travelers abroad, uh, Chinese student, students studying abroad, and there are many paying their own tuition you know, by the family, their families, the faster growing life expectancy that actually rivals many industrialized nations, including the United States, and the advance in science and technology, education, et cetera. In a sense, the success story of China means that the past of socialist country should not be dogmatic. Rather, it should evolve with the times and meet the needs of the population. In China's case, it's called the socialism with Chinese characteristics, as Carlos uh, you know, mentioned many times in the book. It means that a socialist system fit for the Chinese people, and it will evolve further and be even better for the people. And that, I think, is a very healthy mindset, uh, you know, that... Uh, uh, very practical, I would say, um, down to earth instead of uh, just the empty rhetoric. And the other point I want to make is that, you know, I already said the socialism with Chinese characteristics. Uh, I think socialism has never been experimented in a country with, you know, as large as China, which has a fifth of humanity. You know, uh, I, I always uh, say, I mean, the first thing to understand China is to understand what means a country of a fifth of humanity, because the other country with the same size population as India. And uh, it's, uh, you know, an incredible, incredible challenging job if you are running a country. I mean, in the U.S., I mean, they talk about how tough is running a country of 330 million people, right? I mean, so how about Belgium, where I'm stationed, the population 11 million, which is half of my city, Shanghai, or France, the population 60 million, like uh, Hunan or Zhejiang, but only half of the population of Guangdong province. I mean, they also think that learning their country is tough. And how about a country the size of China? I would say, I mean, if you run, think running, having a ch one child is Raising one child is uh, difficult. How about in China's case, it's not raising one child. It's more like a raising um, 50 children or 150 maybe. Yeah. So that's uh, something people always need to bear in uh, mind that when they study, talk about China. Because uh, the, often the rhetoric in the West, it's, uh, they all believe, I mean, a lot of people pretend to be China specialists. They think it's uh, just, uh, you know, a piece of cake to fix the problem in China, <laughs> where, you know, they don't understand it's a home of a fifth of humanity. I mean, it's uh, every province, every county is like a country in Europe in size. So I, I want to uh, say Carlos' observation analysis is very useful uh, to the Chinese themselves, uh, myself included, because the Chinese saying goes that, uh, I mean, the uh, I just literally translated, there was a famous uh, scenic mountain called the Lusan. Actually, if you study Chairman Mao, it was a famous uh, Lusan meeting. But if uh, the saying goes, like, if you are actually inside the uh, Lusan, you cannot uh, 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 see Lusan clearly. You know, it's uh, almost like the spectators uh, see uh, the match more clearly than the players themselves on the field. Uh, so... I think, uh, you know, uh, Carlos uh, observation as a non-Chinese, I mean, uh, will be very valuable actually. When I posted uh, the book launch uh, on my WeChat, uh, you know, a moment, uh, you know, one of my uh, friend, colleague, a senior editor in Beijing asked immediately where she can get the book. So it's obviously Chinese are very interested to know how, you know, uh, uh, and someone, you know, from based in UK uh, studying uh, China, socialism, an expert on that uh, uh, could uh, provide a valuable food for thought for Chinese. I mean, they are eager, I think. I mean, that, I think uh, one of the uh, strong features in China in the last 45 years uh, is their uh, 
eager to learn from the outside world. Uh, and uh, fourth, I want to quickly say that uh, uh, I think uh, China, uh, Carlos made a strong argument that China is not an imperialist country or neo-colonialist country, some Western politician like to say. I mean, I, as a Chinese, uh, I would say, uh, you know, I don't think any Chinese would want China to become remotely like an imperialist country because of the bitter, bitter memory they have of being oppressed and exploited by the imperialist country, if you point to, you know. Uh, so I think uh, uh, China regards itself as a developing nation that is being a oppressed and exploited by the Western power. And China has learned its lesson and made achievements in the last decades. And I very much hope that uh, other developing countries in the global South especially can replicate some of the success while avoiding the mistakes that China has made in the last uh, four and a half decades. And because the uh, see. And very interesting, Carlos mentioned Ethiopia. I was in Ethiopia 2014. See, actually, the construction of the light rail and the railway to Djibouti. I mean, so all the Eastern Industrial Park where Chinese hope to help in, uh, Ethiopia industrialize because China see in the Ethiopia as sort of a China in the 1970s that got great potential to living people out of poverty, lifting people out of poverty, raising the living standards of Ethiopian people. So I think China, that's a Chinese optimism, not just for Ethiopia, but for Africa, many developing countries. That's, I think, China's genuine. I, I mean, growing up in, in the, uh, in the Mao's days, I, I mean, see African as a brothers. I mean, that's how, you know, I would grow up with. Uh, and the uh, fifth, uh, probably the last I want to say is that uh, China world is uh, really facing the great, great uh, change, uh, challenges. I mean, the Cold War and the even Hot War uh, provocation by the United States and uh, its uh, puppet states, I would say. And uh, so, Carlos book uh, is very useful to help uh, people understand China in the 21st uh, 21st century and uh, you know given the unprecedented propaganda campaign launch, launched by the US and uh, it's not hard to tell the hyster hysteria if you just look at the US uh, uh, president Joe Biden's nonsense uh, just a few days ago you know I think uh, there was a lot of I would say like a Nazi type hate speech on China by say Republican presidential candidates, you know, as they geared up for August 27 debate. I mean, if you just check Nick Haley's uh, tweets, I mean, it's uh, he tweets more hate speech on China, China than he arguing things about the United States. Yes, in Kruger, uh, thank you very much, Carlos, for the good job done. And uh, I, I'm looking forward to hear uh, the panel's uh, discussion. And I think uh, uh, Chinese people are very eager for your advice, too. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Um, I, our next speaker is Amanda Yi. Uh, Amanda Yi is an organizer and writer based in Brooklyn. She's the editor of Liberation News, and her writings have appeared in Monthly Review Online as well as in the Real News Network and Black Agenda Report. And Amanda also runs, a, she's the host of a podcast called Radio Free Amanda. So please go ahead, Amanda. Yeah, um, thanks for having me. Uh, I wanna congratulate Carlos for publishing this book um, and also extend my gratitude to all the organizers of this event and including me on this very impressive panel. So in this period of U.S. hostility against China, this is a really important book that provides a critical understanding of China's socialist system. And as Carlos discussed in his opening remarks, um, it thoroughly disproves this idea that this new Cold War is what some may refer to as an inter-imperialist rivalry, a concept which I believe is not only a misunderstanding of how U.S. policymakers reorganized the world following World War II, but also just disarms the anti-war movement politically in that it obfuscates the role of the true aggressor, which is and always has been the U.S. 
I wanted to speak specifically to the last chapter, um, oppose the new Cold War on China, and talk a bit more about the context and particularities to what this new Cold War looks like in the United States, uh, where I'm located, and the political mechanisms that are being used to advance it. Um, as Carlos points out in this chapter, there are similar strategies applied between this new Cold War on China and the previous Cold War against the Soviet Union. Um, and these are tactics that they hope will achieve uh, the counter-revolutionary overthrow of the CPC. Um, just as it did to the Soviet Union, uh, the U.S. is applying the same policy of containment against China, which involves military pressure and encirclement, subjecting it to bans and boycotts, cutting it off from key technologies to thwart its modernization, um, while also fueling contradictions within, which the US hopes will lead to balkanization. And that's the idea behind this containment strategy, uh, then as now, is that this constant external pressure applied by the US um, in their eyes would then heighten the internal contradictions, magnify internal problems such that they boil over and China would just collapse from within. And just like the previous Cold War, um, this new Cold War carries with it its own uh, kind of Red Scare paranoia, where any opponent of this heightened aggression is subject to McCarthyite smears of being a foreign agent or a spy. And I wanted to read a quote from um, Senator Joseph McCarthy's speech from 1950. This was uh, this is referred to as his loss of China speech. Um, and this is what really launched uh, that era of McCarthyism. So he said, one thing to remember in discussing the communists in our government is that we are not dealing with spies who get 30 pieces of silver to steal the blueprints of new weapons. We are dealing with a far more sinister type of activity because it permits the enemy to guide and shape our policy. This quote is really, um, it's really interesting and telling to me because this is the same logic that's underlying this current red scare that we're in now. That there are shadowy actors within society who are taking orders from the Chinese government to direct policy or public opinion in its favor. Um, today, the critical foot soldiers in this new Cold War include these DC policy think tanks who repackage the same kind of McCarthyite paranoia. And what they say is strikingly similar to what McCarthy said in his speech. Um, for example, a 2022 report by the Council on Foreign Relations accused China of running what it calls a global influence campaign in which it was not only trying to shape U.S. policy and certain to meddle in the then upcoming 2022 mid midterm elections, but it was also continuing, and this is a quote, but it was also continuing a pattern of influence operations it began earlier this century in the Pacific Rim, seeking to shift narratives in its favor and promote pro-Beijing politicians, or sometimes just so chaos and falsehoods. So it's very similar to what McCarthy was saying in his speech in 1950 about, um, you know, actors trying to shift policy and public opinion um, in favor of China. But I also think um, to really understand this new Cold War and new era of McCarthyism, we have to really study and understand its political weapon of choice, which is the Foreign Agents Registration Act, um, or FARA for short. So what FARA is, it's um, it's a public disclosure statute, and it states if you're working on if you're working on behalf of or the interests of a foreign government in the U.S. government's eyes you need to register with the Department of Justice and periodically disclose your activities, um, file reports on your activities and disclose any finances that may be involved. Um, and if you don't, you're subject to prosecution. Now, the problem with FARA is that if you read the statute itself, it's written in such a vague, sweeping manner that it lends itself to a really broad interpretation. And so it's very easily weaponized politically um, by the US government, and it has been. It's written so broadly that technically any foreign NGO or foreign business or foreign media outlet would qualify as a foreign agent under FARA. And FARA is um, incredibly broad in scope, but also selectively enforced according to the political whims and political interests of the U.S. government. It's a piece of legislation that should not even exist. Um, who does and doesn't count as a foreign agent is entirely political. Um, for example, Chinese and Russian media 
uh, outlets like RT and CGTN have been forced to register under FARA. Um, but BBC and The Guardian have not because the latter two pretty much tow Washington consensus. Another example, APAC is one of the biggest and most powerful lobbying groups in the US. Um, its primary purpose is to make sure that members of Congress and other politicians promote the interests of Israel. It's not required to register under FARA, um, nor has it ever been ordered by the Department of Justice to register under FARA. Um, another example is that like think tanks like the Atlantic Council, the Middle East Institute, the Center for New American Security, um, these think tanks get hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars from the UAE. And this is well documented. And in exchange for that, these think tanks write policy reports lobbying on behalf of the UAE government, which then translates to US policy in favor of that government. Um, these think tanks have never been required to register under FARA. So FARA was created in 1938 and it was first used to prosecute those spreading Nazi propaganda. But after World War II, enforcement began to decline. Um, but when it was invoked, it, um, the DOJ used it to go after people who spoke out against U.S. foreign policy broadly. Um, notably, W.E.B. Du Bois was indicted under FARA in 1951 um, for, for petitioning against the proliferation of nuclear weapons. Um, and they went after him uh, using FARA, saying that he was um, promoting the interests of the Soviet Union and trying to say that he was a Soviet agent. Um, in the last 40 years, FARA has been weaponized against anti-war and progressive organizations such as the Palestine Information Office, the Irish Northern Aid Committee, and the Committee in, in Solidarity with the people of El Salvador. So this once obscure uh, legislation is making a comeback and now being enforced with increasing regularity by the DOJ to go after um, anti-war organizations and progressive groups that are opposing this escalating war drive against China, um, as well as ordinary Chinese nationals and Chinese Americans living in the US. And it's being used as um, like a political tool and an intimidation tactic. Um, for instance, nearly every media story you see now where some Chinese person is accused of, of espionage or being a foreign agent, it's almost always a case of FARA being used against them. Um, um, FARA was what was used to go after dozens of Chinese academics under Trump's China initiative, where cases were brought against Chinese researchers for simply failing to disclose um, a foreign affiliation on a grant form. So they were trying to prosecute these like Chinese academics for simply failing, for like simply um, not filling out a grant form correctly. And if you actually look at the cases brought under FARA, the evidence is incredibly flimsy. Um, most of the cases of the uh, brought against the Chinese academics, they ended up in dismissals and the ones that didn't fall apart in court. Um, and most of the researchers targeted accused FBI agents of misconduct during the investigations. So I think this is why Carlos's book is so crucial at this time. Um, how do we even begin to confront this new Cold War if we can't even recognize that we are in one? Uh, within the book, Carlos does a great job of drawing uh, these parallels to the previous Cold War against the Soviet Union. And he also provides crucial context to some of the biggest myths surrounding China that are the results of um, these kinds of US media disinformation campaigns like Xinjiang and um, also, you know, China's practice of so-called debt trap diplomacy. And in doing so, he unapologetically makes explicit who the real enemy is, uh, which this era of McCarthyism tries so hard to obscure, um, which is the U.S. And as Carlos points out, much like the original Cold War, the new Cold War is a sustained conflict initiated and led by the U.S., between the forces of imperialism, hegemony, and unipolar unipolarity on the one hand, and the forces of socialism, sovereignty, and multipolarity on the other. Thank you so much, uh, Amanda. So perfectly timed uh, and, and really enlightening. So thank you very much. Um, can you can hear me? Yeah. yeah. Uh, so our next speaker is Dan Kovalik. Dan teaches international human rights at the University of Pittsburgh's 
School of Law. And he writes an enormous am amount about Nicaragua, including Nicaragua, a history of US intervention and resistance. And uh, of course, also about Venezuela, uh, including a book called The Plot to Overthrow Venezuela, how the US is orchestrating a coup for oil. Uh, this book also included a foreword by Oliver Stone. Uh, Dan has served as the in-house counsel for the United Steelworkers for 26 years. Uh, he has been traveling to Nicaragua since 1987 and has been a friend of the Nicaragua and the Sandinista Revolution since that time. His writings have appeared very in a number of different uh, platforms, including the Huffington Post, Counterpunch, and RT. So, Dan, please go ahead. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, and thanks for having me. I'm very excited uh, to be here. I'm very excited about Carlos's book, which I do think is critical uh, at this time. As we really uh, are heading towards a possible war with China, uh, it's very clear that the neocons in the White House uh, want a conflict with China. And why? Because as some, some of the folks pointed to, the U.S. has decided it just can't outcompete. Uh, with China anymore. Uh, you know, I recently wrote an article uh, using Sputnik as, as, as kind of an analogy. You know, when the Soviets put the first cosmonaut into space, John F. Kennedy responded saying, oh, we got to teach, you know, our kids better science and so that we can put a person on the moon by the end of the decade because we got to outcompete the Soviets. Now we've just decided we can't compete, right? So, we're just going to attack our competitors like Russia, like China. And uh, that's a very scary prospect. Uh, when I think of China, I always like to think of this, um, this story, and it may be apocryphal, but it's a great story anyway. The, the story goes that when Nixon visited China in 1972, he asked Zhu Enlai, he said, what do you think about the French Revolution? And Zhu Enlai was said to have responded, too soon to tell. And that really, I think, encapsulates the Chinese view of history, that history is long. China looks to play the long game. They look at uh, their own development many years into the future, not just, you know, for short term profit today. And that's what really distinguishes China, I think, from the West and in particular the United States. And uh, that's why China is winning and the U.S. is losing, frankly. And I think, by the way, as socialist and communist, we have to be willing to accept victor victory as much as defeat. I think many times socialists in the West are defeatists, right? We always look at the losses we've had, and we've had losses, but we've had many victories. And right now, China's winning. Um, we should be happy about that. We should embrace that. Uh, and again, I think in many ways, because they see the big picture in a way we don't. And I think a lot of us, including myself, in the 80s, we were, you know, shocked and didn't understand what China was do doing by embracing some capitalist, you know, forms of, of economic uh, structuring. And uh, we saw this as, you know, a move away from socialism, when in fact, I think it was a move to allow China to survive. And China did survive in a way the Soviet Union did not. Let's face that, you know, in many ways, I think China has proven to be a durable, uh, you know, socialist country. And that's what Carlos points out in his book. You know, and, and again, when you look at the victories, uh, where China was when the communists took power in 1949 and where they are today, it's, there's no comparison. It's the most incredible leap of development the world has ever seen. They took a backwards peasant country and now have made it the most technologically advanced society on earth. That is not a small feat. You know, as Michael Perenni points out, when the communist entered Shanghai in 1949, 20% of the population, 1.2 million people were addicted to opium, right? And that was done intentionally by the British, right? 
Um, can you imagine the societal issues that the Chinese had to deal with? to advance that country. And they've done it, you know, and uh, that is something that is very exciting. You know, another quote that I, I think is very critical to, to kind of meditate on is that of Jimmy Carter, who had a conversation with Donald Trump. When T Donald Trump was in office, he called Jimmy Carter, and wanted to talk about China, the problem with China. And Jimmy Carter said, you know, China hasn't been at war since 1979. The U.S. has been at war almost every year of its existence since the beginning of the Republic in 1776. And he said, China has speed trains. He says, where are your speed trains? And of course, that was a rhetorical question because we don't have any speed trains. And Carter's point was, we don't have any speed trains because we're spending all of our money on war. And of course, that is true. And that is... Uh, a very profound, I think, uh, analysis of events that, ch you know, China's put all its money into technology and lifting hundreds of millions of people out of poverty while the U.S. has wasted all its money on war. While our, our cities collapse and they are collapsing, China is building cities, building green cities helping other countries build cities, build hospitals, build rails. And yet China's begrudge for this. Every speed train is seen as some sort of violation, right? Uh, when China was helping countries out with vaccines during the pandemic, the U.S. derided their vaccine diplomacy. What's wrong with vaccine diplomacy, right? The U.S. has chosen, instead of building, it has decided to destroy through war, destroy countries like Libya and Iraq and Afghanistan and Serbia and Somalia and Yemen. And China has helped build these countries, right? That's the difference between the two, two societies and the two systems, which are very significant differences. And that's why we need to defend China. And that's Carlos's point. It's not just, you know, again, one imperial power versus the other. I think it is one socialist country versus a very aggressive imperial uh, system, especially in the United States. And I think that as was pointed out at the outset of this discussion, there is a problem in the, US, in the U.S. and the Western left with socialist idealism and this idea that a country has to be perfect for us to support it, which has resulted in Western leftists not supporting any country. You know, I have friends who think socialism didn't didn't succeed except for in Russia till 19 the summer of 1918. Why would you be a socialist? I mean, that you're just worshiping failure. Right. And, and I don't think it's been a failure. I think socialism is succeeding. I think China is showing that it can succeed. Has it made concessions? Absolutely. Has it sometimes taken one step forward and two steps back like Lenin talked about? like during the new economic policy of Lenin and the Soviet Union, of course, but always to maintain socialism. And that's what we have to keep our eyes on. So uh, I think this book is very important. I think we need to organize around it. I think we need to organize people in the West to oppose the coming war with China. And I am certain China would cooperate with the West on any issue they wanted to, including climate change and other issues confronting our world. And we need to demand the West to have a cooperative uh, relationship with China, not a violent and aggressive policy. So thank you, Carlos. Thanks for everyone for being on this call. Uh, thanks very much, Dan. That was great. Um, I would like now like to introduce our penultimate speaker, that's Sarah Flounders. Most of you know her. She's a longstanding political activist and author based in New York City. She's a contributing editor to the Workers' World newspaper, a very important source of, uh, 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 of, of, of information from a left perspective and analysis from a left perspective. And she's leader of the United National Anti-War Coalition, the International Action Center, and the Sanctions Guild 
Ethical Campaign. She's the co-author and editor of numerous books, including Capitalism on a Ventilator, The Impact of COVID-19 in China and the US, which she co-authored uh, co uh, uh, with Lee uh, Siu Hin, and more recently, uh, Sanctions, the a wrecking ball uh, uh, in a global economy. So Sarah, please go ahead. Thank you very much, Radhika. And it is such an honor to participate in this discussion. Thank you, Carlos Martinez, for our real contribution to the political level of discussion among Marxists and for over a thousand footnotes to back up every point you make. Now, there have been great reviews because this book is such a valuable resource. In a Worker's World review of The East is Still Red, uh, it's the Carlos's book is defined as a necessary read. The book is a contribution to the discussion regarding the class character of the People's Republic of China. In whose interests does the People's Republic of China operate? in the interests of the people of China. Yes, of course, but it impacts on the global working class. So it's in our class interests everywhere to defend China from the aggressive ideological attack, from the economic attack and the sanctions, and now on the military encirclement, all led by US imperialism. Carlos reminds us of President Obama's famous quote, in describing the pivot to Asia. It is to preserve US hegemony. We have to make sure that America writes the rules of the global economy or China will. Now, what does the US and British imperialism and the G7 imperialist countries fear? China's state-owned enterprises, its publicly owned banks, are the largest source of profit also, there's regulation on the private businesses. But the Chinese state and the Chinese Communist Party directs the economy. And capitalists from around the world, they can invest, but they can't just pull their equipment out and leave. China owns it, and Chinese staff must be trained to operate it. Now, that's what the imperialists consider property theft. They want to control every investment. China does not need the extraction of profit as privately owned banks and industries do. For imperialism, this is a most essential requirement. It's their lifeblood. They are dependent on extracting, on maximizing profit. So China is a defining point for left forces globally, but especially in the United States today because it's the U.S. war machine that is directly targeting China. The entire U.S. productive capacity is focused now on how to disrupt China's supply chain, even if it dislocates U.S. production and wrecks havoc on a global scale. This is a new Cold War and a real danger of it going much further. There's U.S. aircraft carriers, nuclear submarines that are going through the Straits of Taiwan. There's constant overflights in the South China Sea. There's, these are daily provocations. And all of this is justified with the most unrelenting media campaign not seen in decades. A media propaganda campaign so insidious, so all pervasive in every form of media, culture, sports, and openly funded by the NED, the National Endowment for Democracy, really a CIA front. Now, I've had two incredible opportunities to visit the People's Republic of China, and in particular, the Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region, which is a center of the US atrocity myths. The claims of slave labor, we found agriculture to be entirely mechanized, tractors, planters, drones, acres of um, plastic covered greenhouses. It's important to note that there's not one Islamic or Arab country that has backed up the US claims on Xinjiang. And they instead have organized major fact-finding delegations to Xinjiang 
the, the false claims come entirely from the G7 countries by actual organizations they have created and then they publicize. But whether you visited China or not, it's essential for left and progressive forces to be clear on what we defend in China and what does Wall Street wanna destroy in China. Now we're in the midst of organizing a discussion in a number of US cities on this very topic. And it's why the East is still red is such a necessary read, because we have to arm ourselves with political arguments. We need to be aware it's not an abstract topic. It's a living challenge in the class struggle today. We don't get to choose our battles. The U.S. imperialist ruling class has pushed the topic of China to the top of our agenda. <laughs> That's where it's got to be. It's without dispute. Of course, even conceded in the U.S. media that China has pulled hundreds of millions of people out of poverty and into a stable and secure life. It's the greatest anti-poverty achievement in history. And it's something that no capitalist country has successfully achieved. So the big question for those who consider themselves to be on the side of socialist revolution is what's the class character of people's China? We need to answer the, all the vicious twists and ugly distortions and crude US propaganda. And we also need to answer the polite academics and intellectuals who wanna convince working class organizers that there's nothing worth defending in China, that it's no different than the US. We should just limit our attention to immediate bread and butter struggles. In the class struggle, you have to take on all the major issues. Where do you stand? Which side are you on? Isn't that always the essential question? So as the title implies, Carlos makes a may powerful case that China is still a socialist country and that anti-imperialists worldwide should step forward and defend people's China against the US and world imperialism. Consider if imperialism prevailed and is able to halt China's development, this would be a historic defeat, not only for workers and peasants of China, it would have a global impact. The working class in China is actually larger than the working class of all the G7 countries combined, including the US. The collapse of the Soviet Union was a terrible setback for the working class struggle globally in Africa and Asia, here in the US and Europe. The capitalist class gained a huge advantage and set out to recolonize whole parts of the world where gains had been made. Eastern Europe was reverted to its former almost subcolonial status. In Africa, throughout the Arab world, US imperialism set out to literally rip apart national regimes and governments. Now, our task is to win over the working class right here and in Britain and in Canada and throughout Europe to really, so that people understand what's at stake. No imperialist war is in our class interests. Imperialist wars are for the immediate profit of a small handful of corporate giants. We pay, they benefit. But in order to defend China against unrelenting corporate propaganda, the left needs to consciously organize to stop imperialist wars, and we need material to answer the attacks. And so every page of Carlos's book is a concrete fact to answer the corporate media. I want to give one example. There's a thousand of them, but how about the charge that, that China is creating a debt trap for African countries. It's the new imperialist power stealing Africa's resources. How often have we heard that? Now, Carlos quotes the uh, 2022 debt justice report that African governments owe three times more debt to the Western banks than China. And that in truth, only 12% of Africa's external debt is owed to Chinese lenders. China's interest rates are one half those of Western loans. 
And Carlos always gives the footnotes. I, I go back and read them because, gee, there's a whole article explaining so much of this, sometimes a point he makes in passing. Or that China has built more infrastructure in Africa in two decades than the West has in centuries. And that means railroads and ports and water filtration plants and power stations. China offers more scholarships to Africa to, and to African students uh, than all of the Western scholarships combined. So these are the, the facts that it's always so good uh, to have. China is still a socialist country and it has much to teach the world movement. There's an arrogance that says, oh, nothing to be learned from China. There is an incredible amount. So we need to defend it against the real imperialist oppressors and in concluding, um, I'll say that among those who are for socialism, how to understand China and really step forward to defend China is the immediate challenge. All the most powerful uh, imperialist forces are pulling the other way. Carlos's book is a real primer with basic arguments. 600 million workers in China, larger than the working class of the entire G7 imperialist countries, and nearly 100 million. Communist Party members are defending socialist property rights. So even though a capitalist class has grown and there's inequality in wealth, the sheer size of the growing Chinese working class and the Communist Party of China, politically conscious, highly organized, that is a significant, historic, world-changing development. The China's economy weathered the 2008 capitalist crisis that brought capitalist finances to the brink of collapse is proof that it's the, not the billionaires who are driving decisions in China. The capitalists of the West were not saved in China and the Chinese capitalists were not saved or bailed out. State resources went to the biggest infrastructure building programs in China's history and millions of Chinese workers who were suddenly laid off overnight when the capitalist firms globally collapsed were immediately hired into Chinese programs. So this is socialism. Wrap up, yes. Yep, this is the ending. Okay. Uh, this is socialism with Chinese characteristics and, and Carlos convinces the reader to resolutely oppose the new Cold War on China. It's a service to the worldwide movement for socialism. Let's remember that essential distinction, U.S. bombs, China builds. Our task is to defend people's China. And thank you for this program, which helps do that. Thank you so much, Sarah. That was really great. Uh, so now our final last but not least speaker is Charles Xu. Uh, Charles represents the Chiao Collective, and so uh, the general convention is that we introduce the collective rather than Charles personally. The Chiao Collective is a Chinese diaspora media collective that aims to challenge rising U.S. aggression towards the People's Republic of China and to equip US anti, the U.S. anti-war movement with the tools and analysis to better combat the stoking of a new Cold War conflict with China. And of course, I can't think of a better person to and a better uh, uh, organization to end uh, this uh, promotion of Carlos's book. So Charles, please go ahead. Thank you so much, Radhika, for that generous introduction. Thank you to the um, Friends of Socialist China and International Manifesto Group uh, and the other co-hosts of this event. Um, and to my fellow speakers as well. Uh, on behalf of Chao Collective, we would uh, really want to warmly congratulate Carlos on uh, the publication of this book, The East is Still Red. Um, and I want to speak a little bit from, from our particular perspective. As Radhika mentioned, we are a diaspora Chinese media collective um, <clears throat> formed at the start of the COVID-19 pandemic to challenge the unrelenting information war has been waged against China by the U.S. and its imperialist allies and vassals. And we do this recognizing that this is a war waged on several fronts directed at a number of distinct audiences using somewhat different narratives and, and, and often mutually contradictory narratives, right? Uh, there is one prong of this war that is directed at the general public within the U.S. and the rest of the imperial core, 
This is grounded often in overt anti-communism and xenophobic racism. Um, there's another uh, prong of it that is specifically directed at the self-identified left in the West. And this is where you'll see the uh, uh, critiques with a more progressive sheen, indeed, sometimes not only anti-capitalist and anti-imperialist. Um, this is where a lot of the uh, arguments, particularly surrounding Chinese domestic policy uh, under the market system, and also in, in places like Xinjiang would fit. Uh, another front is directed at the people of the global south, but especially their comprador elites. And finally, um, there's, there's a very important prong of this war that is directed at elements in Chinese society itself uh, that are most susceptible to Western influence. For example, the liberal intelligentsia and the middle class. Now, of course, in Chao, um, we are based primarily in the US and therefore our interventions focus primarily on the former two, especially on uh, you know, our fellow um, self-identified members of the Western left. However, our internationalist commitments do demand attention to the perspectives of the global South. Uh, that vast majority of humanity with which the People's Republic of China has always rightly identified itself, but which the United States is trying to sunder from China and to treat as a passive domain of contestation uh, you know, with China in the new Cold War, just as it did vis-a-vis -vis the Soviet Union in the old one. Furthermore, our position specifically as the Chinese diaspora in the West does imply a direct personal stake in U.S. propaganda efforts directed within China itself. Um, you know, in particular at, at people who could very well be our friends, our peers, our loved ones, right? Whose own everyday fears, dissatisfactions, and critiques uh, of the reality that they're living through constitute the raw material out of which the United States cynically hopes to forge a long-term project of internal subversion and regime change. And so, you know, this is this is a, a very multifaceted war that we're facing. And uh, one of the really valuable things about Carlos's entire body of work, including but not limited to this book, is that it addresses all fronts of the information war. For example, long before <clears throat> um, I got to know Carlos personally through uh, our involvement in the No Cold War campaign, I first encountered his thoughtful analyses of actually existing socialist projects on his blog, Invent the Future, which has been running for uh, quite a few years now. And in particular, uh, his series on the fall of the USSR, <clears throat> which was eventually collected into his first book, The End of the Beginning, Lessons of the Soviet Collapse, made a big impression on me because in reading it, I was particularly struck by the primary importance um, in the tragic collapse of the Soviet Union of ideological stagnation, of the crisis of revolutionary legitimacy uh, within both the party and the state, and of the desire um, which was uh, impelled in many ways by Western propaganda to integrate or reintegrate into the Western-led world order as a normal country, which of course led to economic subordination, disintegration of the country, and its descent into economic destitution, and a maelstrom of ethnic chauvinism, as we've seen tragically uh, in, in recent years in, in Ukraine. Um, and a word, you know, this whole process uh, in the parlance of the modern day Communist Party of China and of Xi Jinping, right, who are uh, in many ways the, the closest students of this process, it was historical nihilism. Um, and it's, it's something that they studied very closely as, as Carlos details in chapter three of the book, Will China Suffer the Same Fate of the Soviet Union? And they recognize that this is a dynamic that is at play in almost all the remaining bastions of actual existing socialism, including China, Vietnam, and Cuba, as well as newer projects of socialist construction. This is something that uh, I had the opportunity uh, to witness firsthand this year on visits both to Cuba in April and May with the International People's Assembly Youth Brigade, and then later uh, in July to Venezuela with a brigade uh, led by the Los Angeles Tenants Union, and came out of those visits with two very strong impressions that are relevant to this conversation. One was, uh, you know, I obviously look Asian, right? And, uh, and people were quite open about asking, asking me about that uh, straight up. And upon learning that I was uh, of Chinese descent, I got an immediate and spontaneous positive reaction from almost everyone, uh, you know, at, at, at all levels, from the leadership of the uh, Instituto Simón Bolívar in, in Venezuela, 
to, uh, commun uh, to, to militants uh, working to build up the communal project at the ground level to ordinary street vendors in the working class Afro-descendant barrio of San Agustin in Paracas. And this came out of a deeply felt uh, popular appreciation for what we call multi multipolarity, right? This is a really spontaneous and unprovoked uh, expressions of gratitude to um, countries like China, Russia, and Iran for the material and moral support that they provided in COVID vaccination, in sanctions relief, and in concrete material investment in the projects of self-governed communal construction, which really served to strengthen popular sovereignty and national sovereignty, rather than undermining it through relations of, of dependency and underdevelopment. Um, that, that was, you know, very often a, a completely unprovoked reaction, you know, uh, uh, that, that I got from all quarters, simply upon, upon, you know, broaching the subject of China, right? Another very relevant um, trend that I saw repeat over and over was uh, open acknowledgement at all levels that both countries, Cuba and Venezuela, are undergoing crises of emigration, especially emigration by the youth. This is rooted in, in the difficulty of sustaining revolutionary energy into the second or third generation, especially under conditions of extreme material privation. And that, of course, is part of the intentional and coordinated strategy of hybrid war waged by the U.S. Uh, you know, cr uh, crushing sanctions and blockades rob these countries of foreign exchange and needed imports, and these create the conditions where people are more susceptible to the information war, which robs them of their spirit of sacrifice, their will to resist imperialism, their attachment to revolutionary ideals. The resulting emigration crisis rob, um, robs the country of the potential of its youth, and it also creates a growing U.S.-based diaspora that is ideologically conditioned to reinforce imperialist narratives directed at uh, revolutionary projects in their home countries. And in this strategy, the siren song of the so-called American dream really plays a crucial role with its promise to certain favored classes of immigrants of uh, so-called upward mobility into middle-class material prosperity, which really is founded on uh, the private ownership of stolen native land. Uh, and so we see in that both a false universality uh, of the American way of life and an equally false exceptionalism vis-a-vis uh, -vis these, uh, the, these projects of socialist construction. Now, this is a project, uh, as I reflected many times during these trips, that has been at work in China itself since at least the beginning of the reform and opening period, albeit with certain subtleties. And the thing is that we ourselves in the US-based Chinese diaspora are products of it, quite literally. Because as the second generation, uh, as most of us are, many of us are children of Chinese immigrants who arrived in the US drawn by the promise of the American dream, or at least the very visible gap in material wealth that existed between China and the United States at the time that they left, which was in the, in the 80s and 90s for most of us. But the thing is that the very foundations that enabled our parents' generation to emigrate and largely to succeed in, in uh, material terms in this new environment were laid in socialist China and not just today's socialist China, but Mao era socialist China in the titanic strides that were made towards um, what Xi Jinping today calls the Chinese dream in the domains of education, particularly literacy, in healthcare and land reform, in the building of infrastructure and industry, right? Um, that really enabled our parents' generation to, to, uh, uh, to emigrate and, and to succeed. And the thing is that they left at a time when the prevailing belief on both sides of the Pacific was that the what is today called the Chinese dream would converge completely with the American one, that by inviting foreign investment, by adopting market relations internally, and yes, by sending so many of its best and brightest abroad, China would rise on terms dictated by the United States and it would quietly submit to Western liberal ideological hegemony. Now that convergence, of course, did not happen as expected. Today's Chinese dream as articulated by the Communist Party is grounded in a renewed commitment to building a quote, modern socialist country by 2049. It's grounded uh, and it has its most concrete and highest expression today in the uh, titanic achievement of the eradication of absolute poverty by 2020, uh, for which, you know, see chapter four of, of Carlos's book, as well as the construction of an ecological civilization as, as referenced in chapter six of the book, as scales that are literally inconceivable 
under the political economic regime of the United States. So we can say then that, that the foundations for China's continued existence and its rising strength as an alternative then were also laid in the Mao era, particularly in the undiluted revolutionary inheritance that we see, for example, in poverty alleviation, drawing direct inspiration from land reform in the pre-1949 revolutionary base areas. And that is the real value to all of us um, in the anti-imperialist left of chapter one of the book, uh, No Great Wall, the Continuities of the Chinese Revolution, particularly for those of us in Chao Collective and the uh, broader progressive Chinese diaspora, as we contend with two, two seemingly contradictory tendencies in the milieus that we grew up in and uh, that we identify with politically. One being the wholesale repudiation of the Mao era by many of our families, uh, by pro-capitalist elements still in China itself, as uh, a historical aberration, right? That was overcome by reform period, by marketization, and that uh, must be completely buried, you know, by a full transition to capitalism. And the other tendency is one that we see often uh, within the Western left of, you know, a certain uh, idealization of the Mao period, or at least of, uh, you know, the wholesale repudiation of the reform period that has followed it as a betrayal of socialism, which ignores the lived reality of the vertiginous rise in material well-being that has been experienced by the vast majority of over 1.4 billion Chinese, uh, you know, both within mainland China and including our families on both sides of the Pacific. Um, the, yes, um, what, what Carlos really provides throughout this book and especially in chapter one is, is a narrative that counters both of those. Uh, and and in which we can really ground our analysis. So to wrap up with this book, um, Carlos has offered, particularly those of us on the left Chinese diaspora, a powerful tool for understanding our own formation as people, which is a necessary precondition for forming ourselves as a political subject. And I want to I re return to this point that um, uh, Chen Weihua made earlier, uh, this, this saying, um, um, which is to say, you know, that that sometimes you can see what's happening clearest from the outside, right? Um, and in this sense, I think Carlos stands in the long time-honored tradition of non-Chinese observers standing in complete solidarity with the revolution and making it legible to people in the West, including those of Chinese descent. Uh, and the ranks of, of his forebears, like Edgar Snow, Ad Agnes Smedley, Anna Louise Strong, and William Hidden, I think, um, would all gladly welcome him into their ranks uh, today as, as someone who has done so much uh, to, to make the continued vitality of the Chinese revolutionary project uh, uh, legible and an object of really meaningful solidarity for those of us on the left in, in the West. Thanks so much, uh, Charles. That was really uh, very interesting and insightful. Uh, we will now give Carlos a few minutes to respond to whichever points that uh, that he feels he really must respond to. Um, yeah, please go ahead, Carlos. Uh, thank you very much, Radhika, and thanks so much to all the speakers uh, who I think you know. I think people will agree. Every contribution was extremely informative, extremely useful, extremely powerful, um, and in many cases, very moving. I don't want to say too much. I'll just pick up a couple of points. I must object to, be, to being uh, put in a, the same category of people such as Edgar Snow and Ag Agnes Smedley, who really seriously dedicated their lives and achieved incredible things. Um, I, I don't deserve that. Definitely not yet, um, but very kind of you to say so. Um, so first thing is, today is the happens to be the birthday of uh, Fidel Castro, uh, one of the great revolutionaries of our era, perhaps the greatest, um, who would have been 97 years old today. And in that context, I think it's very uh, pertinent and useful to, to bring up uh, a very powerful quote of Fidel's um, about socialist China, you know, as many of you here will know, the Republic of China and the People's Republic of, uh, sorry, the People's Republic of China and the Republic of Cuba didn't always have the very best of relations. They came down on different sides of the Sino-Soviet split. 
um, and you know relations were were tense throughout much of the 70s and 80s. Um, but uh, after yeah, with beginning with a special period or beginning really with the late 1980s, they re-established their friendship, uh, re-established relations. China gave a huge amount of support to to Cuba after the collapse of the Soviet Union during the special period, um, which was really uh, it, which played an important part in Cuba's survival, the survival of revolutionary socialist Cuba. And Fidel visited Beijing in the early 1990s. And under interview, he explores this idea of whether China is socialist, whether, whether China post-1978, post-reform and opening up, is still socialist. Um, and I'll just quote that. He says, if you want to talk about socialism, you must not forget what socialism has done in China. Once it was a country of hunger, poverty, disasters. Today, there's none of that. Today, China feeds, clothes, cares for, and educates 1.2 billion people. I think China is a socialist country, and Vietnam is a socialist country as well. And they insist that they've introduced all the necessary reforms precisely to stimulate development and to continue advancing towards the object uh, objectives of socialism. And he, you know, he says there's no there's no pure socialism. Look at Cuba, for example. We've got many different forms of private property. We've got thousands of landowners who own, you know, in some cases up to 45 hectares. In Europe, they'd be considered latifundistas. So practically all Cubans own their homes and we're open to foreign investment, but we're still socialism. You know, he says, none of this detracts from Cuba's socialist character, just like China's reforms don't detract from China's socialist character. So on the 97th anniversary of Fidel's birth, it seems useful and relevant um, to quote his assessment of Chinese socialism. Um, Sarah raised you know, really, you know, arguably the key question that is that is raised by the book. What is the class character of people's China, which is a difficult and ongoing and complex question and discussion uh, within the left globally? Um, we've we've talked lots about it. The book talks lots lots about it. I'll just bring up a point that I often make, which is that you know you can tell quite a lot about a country's class character by the priorities of its government. Like, let's compare China with the United States. What does, what does the Chinese CPC-led government prioritize? Over the last three years, it certainly prioritized saving people's lives from the COVID-19 pandemic. It's prioritizing common prosperity. It's prioritizing getting people out of, out of poverty. Prioritizing developing green energy systems to protect the planet. It's prioritizing green electric public transport, rolling out infrastructure throughout the entire country, tackling corruption, which is you know, very important popular demand in China. And it's prioritizing the construction of peaceful and mutually beneficial relations with the countries and the peoples of the world, the, the, the construction of a multipolar future. And you know, those priorities are consistent with the needs, with the aspirations of the people of China. Um, and that tells you a lot about the class character of China. Compare that with the US. What's the US done in terms of prioritizing saving people's lives from COVID-19? You know, we're talking about a country where 1.2 billion people have died totally unnecessarily um, from the pandemic. It's a country that prioritizes fossil fuel profits over preventing climate breakdown. It's prioritizing right now, ramping up its proxy war against Russia. Um, meanwhile, encouraging the countries of Europe to break their energy relationship with Russia and increase their coal production and increase their imports of uh, fracked shale gas from the US over meaningful long-term solutions to the climate crisis. It prioritizes private medicine. It prioritizes the pharmaceutical industry. It prioritizes the military industrial complex as opposed to prioritizing peace. Those are not the priorities of the working class. They're not the priorities of the people. Those are the priorities of the elite, the capitalist class. And, and the essential difference is clear. You know, it's precisely the class character of the country. You know, unlike in the US, power in China is not by any means dominated by a capitalist class. Yes, 
there are capitalists in China, there are billionaires in China, very rich people and big businesses and so on, but they're not allowed to organize as a class. They're not allowed to dominate political power. China remains a workers' state, what was, you know, as it was set up in 1949. And, and that explains why China is thriving today, why hundreds of millions of Chinese live far better now than they ever have done. Um, Dan also raised a really crucial point that. Um, and a very true and important point that China wants to cooperate with the West. Um, and this is something that Sarah brought up as well. You know, China doesn't want this new Cold War. China doesn't want this escalating hostility, this hybrid warfare. China wants cooperation. China recognizes what a lot of people around the world recognize, that there are very serious global problems that we need to cooperate on, uh, particularly in relation to pandemics, particularly in relation to climate change, particularly in relation to the, the threat, the possibility of nuclear war. Apart from anything else, uh, I, and this is uh, a point that was made, I think, by Amanda, um, you know, Cold Wars are not always very cold. The, the original Cold War was not cold at all for the people of Vietnam or the people of Korea or Indonesia or Brazil or Nicaragua or many other places, right? Um, and there's the constant threat of escalation of this conflict, you know, a, a, rela a relationship which is defined mainly on the basis of hostility and antagonism can easily escalate, could easily turn into uh, an armed conflict between nuclear powers, you know, and, and in this case, one of the sides involved is the most aggressive, the most militaristic power in history, you know, the, whose economic policy is based on military Keynesianism. Um, so that's a, that's a very real existing danger of this new Cold War that it escalates. The other thing is that we've got this obvious need for cooperation in the face of global challenges in the face of climate change, which is a threat to all of humanity. We're on the cusp of these planetary tipping points that could result in large tracts of this planet becoming uninhabitable, right? Um, so the new Cold War is not just a danger to China. It's not some kind of abstract thing. It's a danger to all of us. I mean, without wanting to um, engage in hyperbole, it's 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 a threat to uh, a, a viable future of humanity, and therefore we must all um, uh, we must all stand firmly and strongly against it. Um, last point I'll make is just about what Amanda said in relation to the rising McCarthyism in the West, um, and I, you know, just occurred to me this morning as I was thinking about it the absurdity of this idea that people who support China, who support Chinese socialism, who defend China, or, or even who are just opposing the new Cold War, who are opposing this hybrid warfare, are some kind of paid agents of the CPC. It's such a ridiculous idea. It's such a crazy vanity on the part of the US, on the part of the West, on the behalf of capitalism and imperialism, that you couldn't possibly support China and you couldn't possibly oppose the new Cold War unless you were some kind of paid foreign agent, you know, um, and I think it should be perfectly clear to any socialist, to any communist, to any Marxist, even to any progressive and peace campaigner, you know, China's engaged in a project of building socialism. China's the world leader in poverty alleviation. China's the world leader in renewable energy, in biodiversity protection, um, in, in electric vehicles. You know, it's a leading force pushing for a peaceful world, a multipolar world. It's a country that doesn't go to war. It's a country that doesn't engage in destabilization and regime change. It's a country that establishes friendly relations with as many countries as it possibly can, and particularly the socialist countries, particularly the progressive countries. It's pursuing peaceful solutions around the world, including, you know, most recently um, facilitating uh, a rapprochement between Iran and Saudi Arabia, these successes are very inspiring, they're very important. Um, and to, to support them and to celebrate them and to discuss them and, and to discuss their implications for the rest of the world doesn't, you know, it's got nothing to do with being paid. You know, they're obviously sensible, they're obviously correct positions that I would take as a principled person who has got some understanding of politics and history. And as I pointed out on social media earlier, like the irony is that the people making these accusations, they are paid people at the New York Times who are coming out with these accusations, people at the Daily Beast and various other um, organs of imperialist media, 
what they're doing, that they're paid to uphold the status quo and to criticize China, to criticize Cuba, to criticize Nicaragua and Venezuela, Vietnam, People's Korea, and all other countries and all other movements which are pushing forward towards a new society, towards socialism. I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thanks so much, uh, Carlos. Um, uh, that was really a, a great set of responses. And uh, I would just like to, I think we can now open up for a few minutes of questions and answers. We don't have much time left, but we'll go a tiny bit over our re regulation two hours. But in the meantime, while you are thinking of questions to ask, I will ask uh, the sponsors of this uh, event. That's the International Manifesto Group, the Critical Theory Workshop, the Friends of Socialist China, and Midwestern Marx to see if uh, they would like to say anything. I'll start off with um, uh, Alan uh, Freeman, who will speak about the International Manifesto Group and um, then go to the others. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Radhika. Can everybody hear me? Can I join the speakers in congratulating Carlos on a very, very important achievement? And I'm, I'm going to take a text today from a surprising source, which is Edmund Burke, who in 1770, this is before he went wonky on the French Revolution, he said, when bad men combine, the good must associate, else they will fall one by one, an unpitied sacrifice in contemptible struggle. And the point that he's making is that the step of explaining the true function of China, and also I think of Russia, is a very important one. But more is needed, that we ourselves have to act and we have to associate, not act as individuals, but act as an association. So one of the things that International Manifesto Group has from the outset endeavoured to do is bring together isolated people so that we make our strength clear to the world and get our point of view over. And that's why things like this um, book launch are very important for us. It's getting the message across by associating. So I'm therefore going to make a small appeal, which is to join us. Make a small contribution, and there's two kinds of contributions. Normally I come on, my role is to ask you for money, but here I'm asking for activity. You can volunteer, you can support us, you can join our magnificent web team who is struggling away to get our output out to the world, our YouTube team who is struggling away. And I just want to share a screen and show you, uh, talk you through um, how you can do that after I've got away from my, uh, my Edmund Burke quote. Um, bear with me. Uh, Google, Zoom has a habit of obscuring what we're doing. Okay, this page is the International Manifesto Group page, and I want you to notice at the top where it says Act Better. We run the Geopolitical Economy Research Group, where it says Think Better, and we run a news and analysis site, which reports from the left, from the whole of the left, um, about what's happening in the world where we say no better. So think better, act better, know better. From any of these, you can visit the other sites, so they're easy to find. I'd also draw attention to our YouTube channel, and I've put all these links into the, into the, um, into the chat. Now, if you go to any of these, you'll find under About, Volunteer, and if you click on any item, you'll see three buttons down the side, donate, volunteer, and subscribe. Subscribe subscribes you to our YouTube channel. So what do I urge you to do? First of all, the simplest thing is just subscribe to the YouTube channel. It boosts it, especially if you like that. Like when you see this video on YouTube, just like it because it, uses, it means the algorithm sends that to other people. But if you would like to volunteer, we now have a system of teams which you can integrate yourself into. There's a whole variety of things. Um, no talent is too small. Um, sometimes it can vary from you know one hour one hour a week to to half a day a week. That's up to you. But do take that step of coming forward to us, sending that form in, and saying, "Okay, I I want to work with you. I want to stop the bad guys. <laughs> I want to associate." So that that's me. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Alan. Uh, would somebody, oh, I know Carlos Garrido would like to say a word or two about uh, Midwestern Marx. And then if Keith or Carlos would like to say anything about Friends of Socialist China, we will go there. 
so yeah, Carlos, please go ahead. Uh, well, thank you so much, uh, Radhika, for letting me say a thing or two. And um, thank you so much for hosting uh, this event, which uh, we are uh, pleased to have been able to co-host along with the Critical Theory Workshop, Friends of Socialist China and the IMG. Uh, thank you to all who presented. I thought it was a very insightful um, and enjoyable event. Um, uh, the Midwestern Marx Institute is a broad project to try to bridge a gap that we saw uh, exist between the left in the U.S. and the working masses at a time where the American people are more discontented than ever. The uh, rise of a middle class, which made it difficult to organize at a broad scale in the last century, has been completely destroyed. and. Uh, it's been reproletarianized as uh, it's a concept that we use at the Institute. And, you know, a lot of the main fetters that pre prevented working class unity in previous periods have been overcome. And we're dealing with a time where there's a great crisis of legitimacy in the U.S. People are not only discontented, not only are their lives worse, not only is the youth and my generation the first one in American history to look at a future where their living standard is significantly uh, uh, less than their parents. Uh, but it's a crisis of legitimacy in the sense that the people do not trust the media. I think statistics have shown that around only 11% of the people trust the mainstream media. Uh, they don't trust their politicians. I've seen statistics where like 20% of the people think that uh, their representatives actually represent them. And um, when you have conjoined uh, a people that are not willing to continue on in the old way in a ruling class that's faced with a crisis of international legitimacy, a crisis of empire as a multipolar world flowers, which is led by China, it's led by uh, Russia. You know, you're dealing with a situation and then that in the Leninist tradition, we would call, you know, either objectively revolutionary or on the precipice of an objectively revolutionary situation. So in this time, the Midwestern Marx Institute is a, a, a project, a collective that tries to develop what we consider is lacking in our age, which is the subjective conditions. Um, to have some form of clarity, to overcome a lot of the myths that our ruling class and McCarthyism has imbued in American people's heads and that a large chunk of the purity fetish middle class left has accepted things like socialism has always failed or China is a totalitarian regime or state capitalist or whatever uh, they call it. Things which I think Carlos's book does a tremendous job at uh, debunking. Uh, and it's it's so in essential for, for our period, for us in the US to debunk these myths and show that the struggle of China against imperialism, the struggle of, of Africa against imperialism, of Russia against imperialism, it's not a separate struggle from the one that we have here at home. It's the same struggle, it's the same big monopolists who exploit us here at home that are undergoing these wars of conquest and empire. And, you know, as Thomas Sankara uh, once argued, it's the same people who try to plunder Africa who are exploiting Europe and the US too. And uh, this is a message that we're trying to get across to our working masses at home in as broad a form as possible. As I'm sure some of you know, we do the one to three minute short TikTok videos, which very often go viral online. And uh, we also do other things like uh, uh, publish articles on our website. Uh, we have a publishing press where we publish books. We have a, a scholarly journal of American socialist studies. And now uh, recently, as of the last few months, we have a Marxism school where we have various uh, teachers uh, run eight to 10 uh, week long courses on various subjects within the Marxist tradition, within uh, socialist construction, and uh, you know, just a, the task of dispelling myths and uh, raising the people's consciousness and getting some ideological clarity in these uh, complex, troubling, but revolutionary, revolutionarily pregnant times. But uh, thank you so much for, uh, for hosting uh, this event, to Carlos and the speakers for providing us with a very insightful uh, a series of presentations and reasons for why it is an imperative for yeah. the Western, specifically the U.S. left, to support China and oppose the cause of war of our elite, which are keeping us all in tremendous immiseration and debt slavery.
Thanks so much, uh, Carlos. Uh, I've uh, I've uh, shared the uh, website of the Midwestern Marx Marxist group in the in the chat. So please take a look at it. Um, I'm also sharing the website of the Critical Theory Workshop website because Gabriel Rockhill, who would perhaps have spoken about it, is no longer in our meeting. So, and I will uh, at the finally. Uh, 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 give the floor to Carlos, who will say a couple of things about the Friends of Socialist China um, organization. Uh, thank you, Radhika. Uh, I've already spoken too much today, so I'm not going to say a huge amount other than, you know, um, my book is to a pretty significant degree um, based on the work we've been doing over the last couple of years as Friends of Socialist China, uh, which is a website and a platform which is designed to kind of support and defend and promote understanding of the People's Republic of China and of Chinese socialism and to debunk myths, tackle propaganda and oppose the new Cold War. The website is socialistchina.org. Uh, if you go on the website, you can sign up to the newsletter and receive all our posts every Friday. Um, there's usually, there's typically kind of seven to 10 posts in a week, uh, which hopefully, you know, we, we try to co consolidate the best and the most useful information around in relation to China and Chinese socialism. So, yeah, please um, engage with our work, support the work, join, join the events. Uh, obviously, we work very closely with the IMG, with Midwestern Marx, with Critical Theory Workshop and other organizations in you know, a, a maximally non-sectarian way in the spirit of unity to defend and support China and to take lessons from Chinese socialism for our overall shared global struggle against imperialism and towards socialism. Uh, thanks, Carlos. That's great. Uh, and as I say, please do check out the Critical Theory Workshop website as well. Now, I thought since we are we have already gone over our two hours, we will take one round of no more than three questions. So if there are any hands, would you please raise them? Uh, use the mechanical or use the, the Zoom raise hand function, if you please could. I will wait for 30 seconds, see if anybody will has any questions. It's been a pretty comprehensive uh, set of presentations, so I wouldn't be surprised if there are no, there's nobody clamoring to ask a question. Okay, I think I, I think we can assume that there are none. So I just like to then wind all this down by saying thanks to everyone who came. Let me say that there were about 60 people watching on YouTube in addition to about 90 people who were here at the peak. Uh, so we've had already, a, and I know that our, our uh, broadcasts get watched afterwards as well on the IMG YouTube channel. So please share widely. Uh, I also felt uh, that, uh, uh, you know, all the wonderful presentations today on this critically important theme, as many speakers pointed out, it's the perhaps most important theme in the world today. Uh, they were also very energizing because, you know, one realizes on occasions like this that we are not alone and that our numbers can only grow because the irrationality of the position of those who are, you know, the, the opponents is simply becoming more and more manifest. So uh, on that hopeful note, I think I'll get wind this to a close. Thanks to the speakers. Thanks to Carlos for his book. Thanks to everybody in the audience. And thanks to all the four sponsors. Goodbye. And please watch out for the notices of the next International Manifesto Group event. And of course, events from all the other websites. Take a look at them. Uh, subscribe to them. And hope to see you all again very soon. Bye-bye. <laughs>